Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Margaret Howell. It's Friday, December 2nd, 2016. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, it's the Donald Trump Victory Tour. President-elect Donald Trump is now touring multiple states that helped him win the election. And his first stop was Cincinnati, Ohio, where he outlined his America First policy. I'm going to discuss our action plan to make America great again. We're going to discuss. Then, the recount effort to steal electoral votes from President-elect Donald Trump intensifies. Prepare to spark a constitutional crisis and nationwide civil unrest. Rest. And we won it big. But then the people back there, the extremely dishonest press, said, right? All that plus much more up next on the Infowars Nightly News. Well, Donald Trump is on his victory tour saying thank you to the United States that elected him as president, the 45th president of the United States. He made a stop in Cincinnati, Ohio. InfoWars was, of course, on the ground to cover that. Owen Schwer and Michael Zimmerman. And guess what, folks? He had a word for the globalist. You know, his, his credo was Americanism, not globalism. We have an article that's up on our website. It aggregated from Real Clear Politics. It talks about how Trump said no global flag, no global currency, and no global citizenship. That's what we're talking about. He first said thank you in this rally in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he's outlining how to put America first. He goes on to say that now's the time to embrace the one thing that continues to unite all of us, and it's our Americanism. He continued with, we hear a lot of talk about becoming a globalized world. Well, guess what? He's putting a stop to that, putting the globalist on the run. There's no global anthem, no global currency, no certificate of global citizenship. We pledge allegiance to one flag, and that flag is the American flag. You know, I couldn't be happier with this. We spent several weeks hammering home how globalism is, is Hillary Clinton's motto, frankly, and it took her down, and now we have an issued of air an air of issued in peace that's what's coming up next and he goes on to talk about this vow that he's making it's called a new era of peace he's vowing that the u.s is going to stop toppling regimes during the first leg of his presidency of this thank you tour this is what he's saying he's saying our goal is stability not chaos because we want to rebuild our country in its time and i love this message because he's not a neocon president folks you know republican or, or democrat what's the difference these days they all want these wars for profit, you know, invading countries and, and destabilizing them. And then we have this refugee mess uh, that's bleeding at the helm. He's saying we're going to put a stop to that. And something else that he said I could not be happier about. He said, look, just because we're toppling, we're not toppling regimes anymore doesn't mean we're not going to be fighting ISIS, but we're going to be joining in with countries that are fighting ISIS. I'm directly quoting him now. Our goal is stability, not chaos, because we want to rebuild our country. It's time. He vowed then to rebuild the country's depleted military. Military, and then he went on to repeat many of his campaign vows, one of which included fighting ISIS. And we know that Russia is cluster bombing in Syria right now, uh, trying to get rid of ISIS, uh, the ISIS that our State Department actually helped create, by the way, with our erratic and rogue policies, because we want to destabilize these governments. Uh, God only knows why, frankly. It's a sick agenda, and it would have very much continued under Hillary Clinton. But thanks to Donald Trump, it looks like we're going to focus on America. A values, American interest, and we're not going to be engaging in these foreign wars where we're bogging down our resources and then accepting a mass refugee population that we destabilized in the first place. That was on the agenda in his thank you tour. Now, I want to take you to another article. It's also up on our website. It was It's talking about WikiLeaks because we know what Angela Merkel is doing to the European Union. We know what she's doing to Europe and to her own people, frankly. And there's a bombshell that's come out, and it's, it's talking about how WikiLeaks WikiLeaks is going to destroy, it could in fact destroy Merkel's plan for EU domination. This is a warning coming out of Julian Assange. There's been some questions about his whereabouts lately after the Thanksgiving holiday. There was some concern that he may even be dead, but it looks like in fact that we have a confirmation that WikiLeaks has new information and it's regarding Angela Merkel and it could stop her and her intent to absolutely destroy and destabilize Germany. This is good news. You know, we put a stop to this here in America. We said, no, thank you to these rogue globalist policies, but it looks like she's been able to run amok in her own country and destroy Western
Western Europe with these runaway policies where Germany is no longer recognizable to some of us looking at it. But it looks like this trove of WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks documents revealing the true scale of the cooperation between the German and U.S. spy agencies. It's risk. It's at a risk to Angela Merkel herself. It might derail her, her, her hopes of dominating the EU. Now, he goes on to talk about in this article, when you get a second, take a look at it because it's up on our website, the BND Foreign Intelligence Agency of, of Germany and its counterpart, the NSA, WikiLeaks was able to, to gather a lot of information from these agencies. And it looks like we are bracing ourselves for a major reveal. You know, he promised a bombshell regarding Clinton on Christmas Day. And frankly, it might be one of the best Christmas gifts that we've gotten here because Trump has said that he's not going to prosecute her. That doesn't mean that his administration won't. It doesn't mean that Jeff, Ses Jeff Sessions won't as head of the DOJ. It just means for now he's focused on the country and healing the country. But you know what? With new information, you never know. So we have that to look forward to. Now, shifting gears for a moment, I want to take you to the mainstream media. You know, there's been a war lately uh, in this country between the mainstream media. They're calling us fake news. Other organizations and other outlets like Breitbart Media, Drudge, of course, InfoWars. We're actually spouting the truth and telling people the truth. They just can't handle it. There's an article written by Paul Joseph Watson. And he talked, don't you just love Paul, by the way, his snarky intellect? I always find it a joy to read something that he's written or listen to his videos. Check this out. So he's talking about this Yahoo News columnist, and he wants U.S. schools to indoctrinate kids to, quote, trust mainstream media. This is what it's come down to. I'm talking about Matt Bay. And he talks about how social media giants like Facebook, they've censored, quote, fake news, which is actual real news. But that doesn't go far enough. Uh, he doesn't think that that's enough in getting uh, the truth squashed. He wants uh, schools to start something called a media literacy campaign to hold these classes that would instruct impressionable students um, on how to, to not trust sources of information. And what a radical form of thought. You know, somebody should tell him that this isn't North Korea. And uh, hey, guess what? You don't have the, the, the hold on truth and journalism. They're so desperate that they resorted to indoctrinating school children. That's the new push because, hey, guess what? Adults just aren't buying it anymore. You got to go after those impressionable little youth while their minds are still developing uh, so that they trust all the garbage that you're putting out, which is ridiculous. What a radical solution uh, to the crisis that's unfolding with them. Now, we know that Trump took the mainstream media on head on and he won, by the way. And uh, he's taking on a lot of other issues now that he's become president-elect. And one of them is how we treat our veterans in this country. Joe Biggs, he brought this report to you yesterday. And it's of this VA clinic and how it's most likely infected 600 veterans with HIV and hepatitis. Now, we know that the Veterans Affairs Administration, it is completely defunct in this country. We see veterans waiting months for care. Sometimes they're so frustrated, they commit suicide right outside a VA hospital because they just can't take it anymore. We've covered here the one VA hospital in Atlanta. They actually had to install this multi-foot fence on the top of their parking lot on the roof so veterans wouldn't jump over. This case, if you don't find it disgusting, I don't know what could disgust you because when I read it, it made me physically sick. This uh, this Toma VA, it's being investigated. This this case was regarding a dentist, and apparently they didn't sterilize the equipment properly. And it looks like they've infected as many as 600 of our nation's veterans. You know, our precious veterans. All they've done is fight for this country and sometimes engage in wars based on lies. But they did it with a pure and, and pure heart and clean hands. They come back. They deserve care and. Oh, guess what? We have these shoddy clinics that uh, are infecting them with HIV and hepatitis. Uh, thank you very much and Merry Christmas. Wow. That's reminiscent of a case of, of colonoscopies coming out of Tennessee two years ago where they were also infecting veterans with hepatitis and HIV because of unsterilized colonoscopy equipment. It looks like, you know, our only hope is to get this VA system cleaned up in time so that cases like this so that we can stop reporting on them because, frankly, they are just outrageous. And we know that Trump is going to tackle this because he promised to. Uh, and he brought to light a lot of the issues that veterans are facing. And 
sometimes we've seen people on the ground and Owen Schwerer does a great job of interviewing these people. We have this up on our website about how Trump is bringing people together and uh, he was on the ground in Cincinnati. Take a look at this video clip. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com. I'm here with Adam and Noah. They just got out of the Donald Trump rally. Tell me, what was your experience like? Um, I'll tell you what, I, this is my first rally. Um, I've never had any interest in uh, politics growing up. I'm 27 years old myself. Um, I just, realistically, I didn't feel like I understood enough or had a, a grasp of the reality that it's the whole world that affects our policies rather than, you know, just simple issues. Um, but this rally or this election, I personally took an interest. Um, Infowars, I, I use their products every day now, man. Uh, that brain force is off the chain good. Um, and I, I learned politics. Um, I, I delved into it. Um, and there's there's no one else to go for but Donald Trump. And this realistically, this was just, uh, this is just a, a wonderful experience for me. Um, just to really feel like a part of the movement of you know bringing back nationalism americanism um and i think that's that's realistically that's that's what's going to make this country um the, the the great power um and the entity that the rest of the world looked up to for so long we're such a young country and look at the the things we've achieved now what about you young man this is a trump rally you just went to was it your first trump rally this is my second trump rally but i got caught on the outside of the last one in westchester i had to listen from a pretty long ways Way. So tell me about your experience in there. Um, it was really kind of unbelievable. I wasn't ready for um, all the power that was inside of it. Um, the last one being on the outside, you kind of just hear more of the protesters than the people that actually get inside. But once you get inside, you see all the other people that believe in what he's saying and believe that there is hope for America still and that we can make it the best it can be and bring it back to the best days it was. Now, we know that Trump is bringing people together, but if you can believe this, the Electoral College, because of this bogus change.org petition, they're having to re-vote on an election that was already decided on November the 8th. Now, we have this article up, also by Paul Joseph Watson, and it talks about how the Democrats are trying to stall this recount in Wisconsin to steal the electoral votes from Donald Trump. They want to use politics to undermine the will of the voter, and that's exactly what they're doing. And I just want to take you to this one piece of this article. It talks about how Jill Stein, who actually spoke to InfoWars and talked about how Hillary Clinton would start World War III, apparently something has happened to Jill Stein's brain in the course of the time she talked to us at InfoWars and now because she clearly wants to give Hillary Clinton the election uh, because Hillary Clinton couldn't do it legally. So now they want to try this bogus crap to do it illegally. Now, going back to this article for a moment, all the votes in Wisconsin have to be certified by December 13 before electors meet on December 19 to formally cast their votes. And this article talks about how Democrats in certain counties are trying to stall the vote like in Dane County, Wisconsin, for example, because it's very liberal and Madison is located there. And they think that if they can stall the votes uh, in this six day period, that the electoral won't be able to meet. And then those electoral votes that originally went to Trump, they won't be going to Trump any longer. So dirty tactics, it's not gonna stop Trump from becoming president. They're just trying to mar him and muddy him up before he ever gets there because we know that uh, you know they just, they just can't accept the election results despite saying that that we're all crazy if we don't accept the election results, uh, but if they do it, you know, you know, just it's it, they're practicing their democracy. I don't know what they're thinking over there, but it's not going to work anyway, so it doesn't even matter. And it's a gigantic waste of our time to even be talking about it, other than the fact that it's so ludicrous. And speaking of other things that are ludicrous, we found this article for you. It's it's on the Daily Caller. We have it up on our website as well. I want to take you to the San Bernardino terrorist Saeed Farouk and his wife. It turns out that they didn't want to go to their Christmas party, which his wife expressed on Facebook, on her social media page, that she felt that uh, she didn't want to participate in a non-Muslim holiday event. Hence, they decided to kill 14 co-workers um, in their Christmas party because they didn't want to attend the office Christmas party that was mandatory. Now, gunning down 14 of their co-workers, they then circle the city for four hours and of course, they're spotted by local law enforcement that shot them both dead after engaging police in a gun battle. So the tolerant religion of peace uh, that they espouse to apparently uh, <laughs> they were pushed to violence 
and murdering 14 people over a Christmas party because, you know, we just we have the right to say no to those things. And if you don't agree, then we're going to just shoot all of you until you die. So that's what's going on over here now. Talking about uh, the migrant issue continuing on, um, this article, um, Leanne McAdoo actually wanted to talk to you about this this evening. It's written by Chris Tomlinson. It talks about how migrants in Germany, they're insulating themselves from inter from integrating into society. They're becoming more insular and rejecting Western society and Western values in mass numbers. This is according to a new study, and uh, it's citing poverty uh, which is hilarious because poverty is not a reason to become insular and reject Western society. We know that this is an underlying agenda. Uh, the non-assimilation is a common practice. And just because people are poor, you know, I don't even get that study, frankly, because we know that uh, <laughs> the reason uh, of poverty, Germany has overwhelming social programs, and that just seems like um, an excuse to me. But anyway, uh, we've heard a lot of excuses here in the States as well, taking you to that Ohio State shooting. And, Excuse me. The suspect was shot and killed. Uh, he butchered nine people after ramming them with his car. And uh, OSU students, if you can believe this, they're blaming racist America for this terror attack. We have an article up on our website. It aggregated from Rebel Media. Take a look at this reporter as she asked the students why they think this happened. You feel safe on campus after the attack this week? Yep. You do? Would you call it a terrorist attack? Um... Depends on what your definition of terrorism is. According to your definition? No. Would you call what happened terrorism? Uh, no, I wouldn't. No. I would say it was a misunderstanding. Um, misunderstanding? Uh, why would you say that? Uh, because I think that that person probably experienced a lot of racism, and, and racism is a traumatic experience. It's good to know OSU students are getting their money's worth, being taught how to think for themselves over there. That's really comforting hearing their responses as to that terrorist attack. Be sure and stay tuned for more special reports like this. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, Hawaii has a brand new bill that's about to be passed, SB 2954, which requires background checks from the FBI, gun registration, all kinds of horrible things. We're going to get into that with my guest Kevin here in just a moment. Now, we've heard about strict gun laws all across the country in many different states, and it seems to be the areas where there use or usually is the most amounts of crime. And now Hawaii has a bill that has been introduced, it has now passed, it's Senate Bill 2954. And what this is, is a pretty creepy law that could be, uh, that is going to be put into effect on December 5th. So I have Ke uh, Kevin Kakatan from Hawaii who's joining us right now, and he's going to tell us what he knows about this and how it can affect the people of Hawaii. Hi, right, Joe. Thank you for having me and taking the time out to uh, pay attention to this matter that's kind of gone under the radar. Um, I know that California recently has had, you know, their gun Mageddon and, um, I believe it was probably, you know, several uh, propositions that went through. Um, you know, on one hand, it's nothing as bad as that. However, the, the danger here is that what they're planning on doing or what is going to take effect come Monday, December uh, 5th, is that anyone registering a new firearm that day will um, have to essentially pay $42 to enter themselves into what they call the wrapback system. And allegedly the wrapback system is the same system utilized by, I believe, the FBI to uh, for people in positions of trust, as they, um, you know, as they describe it, it's educators, um, people that work for the government, perhaps. But, um, you know, from what I understand, it was never meant to monitor legal firearm owners, but that's what they're planning yeah, on the, doing. So I'm going to read you exactly from the FBI what it means. The Ratback Service allows authorized agencies to receive notification at activity on individuals who hold positions of trust, i.e. school teachers, daycare workers, or who are under criminal justice supervision or investigation, thus eliminating the need for repeated background checks on a person from the same applicant agency. Prior to the deployment of RATBAC, the National Criminal History Background Check System provided a one-time snapshot view of an individual's criminal history status. With RATBAC, authorized agencies can receive ongoing status notifications of any criminal 
criminal history reported to the FBI after the initial processing and retention of criminal or civil transactions by using fingerprint identification to identify persons arrested and prosecuted for crimes. Ratback provides a nationwide notice to both criminal justice and non-criminal justice authorities regarding subsequent actions. I mean, that doesn't sound good to me, does it to you, Kevin? No, actually, it's just essentially a way for them to, you know, in a subtle way, essentially almost criminalize law-abiding gun owners in the state of Hawaii. Um, there are no other groups of people um, or some most professions that aren't, you know, monitored uh, without having anything really been done. And there's a lot of questions as to what could disqualify a firearm owner if they are, you know, under some kind of arrest or, you know, get involved in some kind of incident outside the state of Hawaii that triggers this wrap back alert. Um, obviously, you know, felony arrests, um, domestic dispute cases and all that. But I mean, are they going to be adding any other sort of violations to this that could disqualify someone from um, owning a firearm? They have not been very uh, transparent as to what uh, wrap back is going to involve. Um, you know, they haven't really made much public. In fact, most people don't even know it's going to go into effect come Monday, December 5th. Yeah, exactly. I actually called the Honolulu Police Department and spoke with five different officers, and I asked them, you know, what they knew about SB 2954, um, what it details, is there gun confiscation involved, and none of them even heard of the law at all whatsoever. So you have people who are supposed to know the law and enforce the law and hold people to that standard, and they don't even know anything about it yet, and it's uh, just three days away from rolling out. That's that's still kind of uh, that's still sketchy, you know, that this is going to be a, a new law. And these guys who are supposed to uphold it and know about it have no clue about it yet whatsoever. Right. And, you know, the one of the uh, state senators that had actually um, introduced the bill or helped write it, there was a uh, I, I didn't attend the meeting, unfortunately, but there was a meeting back in um, the summer of 2016 that was kind of held informally at the state capitol. And people in attendance, um, you know, were asking. Uh, the state senator by the name of uh, Willis Sparrow, mm -hmm. um, what was exactly, you know, involved with his decision to write this bill and all that. And essentially, again, not my words, but what other people have uh, claimed, his response was that essentially he didn't really read the bill. Um, he didn't really read the bill at all. And some of our um, astute gun owners, people that are way more educated than I, you know, attempted to um, educate him on what it involved. And some of the other anti-gun folks that were there were also allegedly, you know, from what I hear, were so somewhat surprised as to what it would involve. Um, so it was really, it, it just really seems like a very shaky process. Like they're almost like as if they're making it up as they went along, went along with it. And to me, in my opinion, it just seems like around that time there was that filibuster happening in D.C. And you know, the, and it seemed like they couldn't vote on, you know. Uh, further gun control. So it just seemed like our governor took it upon himself to say, hey, well, why, while the Democrats in D.C. couldn't get anything done, let's just show that we could do something here. And it just seems like that's where this entire thing came about, because despite all of the letters and um, resistance uh, to this bill from Hawaii gun owners, they, they just signed it anyway. Yeah, so it looks like it was introduced on January 27th, and the report title says SB 2954, Criminal History Record Checks, Police, Permits to Acquire Firearms, Hawaii Criminal Justice Data Center, Database Management. Description is authorizes county police departments to enroll firearms applicants and individuals who are registering their firearms into a criminal record monitoring service used to alert police when an owner of a firearm is arrested for a criminal offense anywhere in the country. It authorizes the Hawaii Criminal Justice Data Center to access firearm registration data, you know, and this is the, the interesting thing about it. Now, if this becomes successful and the people in Washington see this and they get some ideas down the road, this could be something that they would try and pass countrywide or nationwide, I should say. And that's the interesting thing. We have a lot of people like Harry Reid that I'm sure would just jump right on this and be all about it. Right. It, it, it is a dangerous thing of setting a precedence and, you know, Honestly, even if it's successful or not, or, you know, how smoothly it goes, I, I have no doubt that other states will try to uh, pass the same thing coming up this, you know, whatever their respective uh, legislation periods are. I mean, we've already seen things happening out of California that other states have tried to adopt. Um, you know, luckily, 
in Hawaii, um, again, luckily for now, um, we've been, you know, we've been somewhat um, uh, bulletproof from some of the uh, atrocious gun laws in California, like, you know, things restricting their semi-automatic rifles and things like that. Again, in Hawaii, we still haven't been affected by that. But things like this rap bill that doesn't directly on the surface seem to affect firearms like magazine capacities and things like that. Um, I can see how these things can go under the radar in some states uh, because it, it may seem benign on the surface, but it really isn't. Um, essentially, we're looking at putting a group of people that have not been convicted of anything onto a essentially a federal watch list. And we've seen how watch lists or lists in general have been compromised. I mean, not too long ago, there was that incident in uh, New York where I think it got leaked out that uh, the all the names and addresses or at least the names of registered gun owners in new york were leaked to the public i mean who's to say that our names on this federal rap back um monitored by i'm not sure if it's monitored by the honolulu police department or the or the fbi who's to say that list won't be compromised and all of our information doesn't get out as well so it's really a dangerous precedence for the entire country indeed it is well you know it's scary when you actually have this. It gets passed, it, but it's so vague too. I'm sitting here looking at the bill, and it doesn't really tell you what happens if you are found to be guilty of uh, breaking this law, so to say. You know, are they going to come to your home? Is there going to be gun confiscation? Are they going to ban you after that from ever owning firearms or purchasing them again? I mean. You know, what's the process of getting put on it? And then what's the process of being removed uh, from something like this? I mean, it, if you were to be arrested and then found innocent later on down the road, you know, so those are the questions we're going to have to ask from here on out. Really, I mean, I think it, as most people have described it here, I mean, it really, it really begins with the, um, the gun owners of Hawaii really standing up and yeah. really supporting the Hawaii Rifle Association, our own local um, gun advocacy group. Um, all right. Well, this there. is all extremely interesting stuff. Hopefully people will uh, call out to, to people in Hawaii and have them stop this if they can. Uh, but this is all the time we have. Uh, thanks for being on here with us, Kevin. This has been Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Thank you, Joe. After roughly six years, the United Nations has finally apologized for bringing the ongoing cholera outbreak to Haiti following the 2010 7.0 earthquake that struck southwest of Port-au-Prince and devastated the already suffering island nation. Well, uh, we have claimed for a long time that we must combine a rather strict uh, legal position on immunity for the United Nations because we have so many consequences of uh, peacekeeping actions that could be affected. The UN continues to deny that their Nepalese contingent unleashed the cholera outbreak, even arguing that the cause was unimportant. The spreading cholera outbreak has killed at least 9,300 Haitians and infected 800,000 more and is currently spreading like a pandemic to the Dominican Republic and Cuba. This was the first time in Haitian history that cholera had reached Haiti, according to professors at Duke University. Clearly, either the occultist elitist New World Order is in Competent or negligent, or just a cog in the vampiric wheel preying on the Haitian people with an ulterior motive. And Venezuelan leader Hugo Chavez has once again accused the United States of playing God. But this time it's Haiti's disastrous earthquake that he thinks the U.S. was behind. Spanish newspaper ABC quotes Chavez as saying that the U.S. Navy launched a weapon capable of inducing a powerful earthquake off the shore of Haiti. He adds that this time it was only a drill and the final target is destroying and taking over Iran. The financial response to the 2010 Haitian earthquake was massive. The Red Cross raised 500 million and the United Nations had claimed to set aside 13.4 billion, including billions in donations from the United States. However, the permanent homes promised by the Red Cross didn't materialize and the Red Cross wasn't transparent on what they actually spent all of that money on. The cash cow was far too tempting to the hovering vultures of the Clinton Foundation. Even Chelsea Clinton was was critical of the response of her own parents, writing, if we do not quickly change the organization management accountability and delivery paradigm on the ground, we could quite conceivably confront tens of thousands of children's deaths by diarrhea, dysentery, typhoid, and other water-related diseases in the near future. Beyond the neglect, 
something far more nefarious was occurring. Haitian children were disappearing. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation reported United Nations officials say children have gone missing from hospitals in Haiti since the devastating January 12th earthquake, raising fears of trafficking. We have documented around 15 cases of children disappearing from hospitals and not with their own family at the time, said UNICEF advisor Jean-Luc Legrand. Trafficking networks were springing into action immediately after for the disaster and taking advantage of the weakness of local authorities and relief coordination to kidnap children and get them out of the country, reported the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. One such person arrested for trafficking was New Life Child's refuge owner, Laura Silsby, who according to WikiLeaks documents, Hillary Clinton had been very interested in nine years before the 2010 Haitian earthquake. And it was Bill Clinton that used his former presidential weight to have Silsby essentially freed. Oddly enough, on November 14th, the Laboratory to Combat Human Trafficking reported that Monica Peterson, investigating the Clintons' involvement in Haiti for the Human Trafficking Center, mysteriously died the day before. Peterson had been highly critical of the Clinton Foundation, writing on her blog, Hillary Clinton should get far more scrutiny for her scandalous conduct in Haiti. From rigging the March 2011 presidential election for her favored candidate Michael Sweet Mickey Martelli, supporter of the CIA-created death squad, to ensuring that her brother Tony Rodham and a company that barely exists got a sweetheart gold mine concession in Haiti that royally cheated the state of Haiti. In a letter to her friend, Peterson had uncovered two huge trafficking scandals and a social displacement scandal with billions in unaccounted earthquake aid leading directly back to the Clintons. She had just begun investigating the correlation regarding the Clinton Foundation's Caracol Industrial Park Complex and its connection connection to a human trafficking network when her life was mysteriously cut short. Something doesn't add up. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm going to discuss our action plan to make America great again. We're going to discuss. Although we did have a lot of fun fighting Hillary, didn't we? Remember when they said he cannot win North Carolina? So we had just won Ohio, Iowa, and we had just won Florida. Breaking news Donald Trump has won Florida. They say, whoa. And we won it big. But then the people back there, the extremely dishonest press, said, right? Very dishonest people. How about, how about, I mean, how dishonest. How about when a major anchor who hosted a debate started crying when she realized that we won? How about that? Tears. No, tell me this isn't true. And you know what she doesn't understand? Things are going to be much better now. She doesn't understand. Remember, you cannot get to 270, the dishonest press. There is no road. <laughs> Folks, how many times did we hear this? There is no path to 270. There is no. There is no path. They said, I'll tell you what, just two, three weeks before the election. And my friends would tell me just the opposite. They live in Texas and Georgia. They said, Georgia is in play. Texas is in play. That means like we're even. And then we won in a landslide, both states. I said, what happened? Right? 
They go, for weeks, Texas is in play. Then you turn on the television like two minutes later. Donald Trump has won Texas, you know. So. These are very, very dishonest people. Okay. This stuff. Should I go on with this just a little bit longer? I love it. How about it's like 12 o'clock in the evening and Pennsylvania, I'm, le I'm leading by a lot. And we couldn't get off 98%. They didn't want to call it. We're leading by so much that it's impossible. If I lost every other vote, and they refused to call. Then at three o'clock, I'll never forget, I watched a particular person. And we won Wisconsin. And we won Michigan. And we won Pennsylvania. Right? And that person is doing the map. And that person was saying for months that there's no way that Donald Trump can break the blue wall, right? We didn't break it. We shattered that sucker. We shattered it. We shattered it. Man. That poor wall is busted up. So, I'll never forget it, though, because it felt so good. You know, more so because they kept saying there's no path and all this nonsense. So, and I go out and I see the people like this, and I say, how are we going to lose? I mean, how are we going to lose? But what happened? So they'd say, we win Wisconsin. Donald Trump, 38 years or so. Donald Trump has won Michigan. And then they're looking at the map. They're saying, oh, wow. There's no way for Hillary Clinton to become president. Donald Trump is president of the United States. Oh, Well, we're 49 days out from Donald Trump becoming president, and we've seen some amazing things already with the saving of Carrier, and we've talked about that at length. I'm not going to go into that right now. We're looking at the Trump transition team. And, you know, most of us are a bit cynical and skeptical about politics. We've watched this for a very long time, and i got to say, I am one of the most cynical, skeptical people you'll find. So I look at the backgrounds of the people that he's chosen or that he's about to choose, and it's hard to just say, let's see how this plays out. I think we should give him the benefit of the doubt. When we look at Steve Mnuchin, for example, the pick for Treasury Secretary. At the beginning of the week, I said it, I thought it was extremely encouraging that he had John Allison, former head of bb and He'd been a banker for 40 years of a regional bank. He knew the problems with regulations. He knew how they worked. He knew the problems with the bureaucracy. And he was a total free market guy. And he had a great background. So I said, boy, I sure hope that Donald Trump picks him. Very next day, he picks Steve Mnuchin. Of course, he has a long relationship with Steve Mnuchin as his campaign finance manager. But the thing that concerns people, of course, is Mnuchin's connections to Goldman Sachs, also to George Soros. There's Soros connections in the background, as well as being at Harvard and being skull and bones. I mean, there's all kinds of things like that we can bring up. But let's take a look at what he has said. Now, as soon as he was appointed uh, Treasury Secretary, people kept saying to him, what are your priorities? And he reiterated what Donald Trump had said. Hey, we're going to cut taxes. We're going to cut regulations. We're going to repatriate capital, all those sorts of things. Look, if he does that, even if he was a Goldman Sachs banker, that's a good thing. That's the right thing to do. And that's what we're going to look at in this article. He's now saying that one of the top 10 priorities for Donald Trump is to get rid of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In other words, to sell them, to put them in the marketplace. He said it makes no sense that these are owned by the government, have been controlled by the government for as long as they have. And of course, Fannie Mae was created in 1938. Freddie Mac in 1970, as New American points out in this article, he says in many cases, they displace private lending in the mortgage markets. We've got to get them out of government control. And they point out in the article, New American, they say Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae was part of FDR's New Deal. It was created to expand the mortgage market by making loans that local or regional banks couldn't make or didn't want to make. Well, why wouldn't they want to do that? It might have to do with the fact that they're non-performing loans. And we should remember that as all this stuff came crashing, 
We had at the head of Fannie Mae, we had Jamie Gorlick, who had been in the Justice Department for Bill Clinton. And he made $26 million in bonuses. So you've got this strange organization that is supposed to be a separate business, but it's created by the government. And then when it went bankrupt and cost taxpayers $200 billion, that was taken over and run in receivership uh, by the Treasury Department. So one of the first things they want to do is get rid of this thing. Let's put this out. Let's privatize it. Let's sell it. It's not something the government should be involved in. I think that's a great idea. And so the new American looks at this and say, well, is this really one of his top 10 priorities? We'll have to see. Maybe it's just a sop, they said, to Trump supporters who are really concerned about another Goldman Sachs alumni uh, being put in the administration. And of course, people like Chuck Baldwin have said, look, if you want to define globalist banking elite no one personifies this better than Steve Mnuchin. He was an investment professional, as I mentioned, with the Soros Fund, with uh, Goldman Sachs. He was there for 17 years. If he really wanted to uh, drain the swamp, he would have appointed somebody like Ron Paul or somebody like uh, John Allison. Nevertheless, they finished by saying exactly what I said at the beginning. Whether he is a plant that has been inserted to steer Trump's ship in favor of globalism or not, Mnuchin is doing the right thing by disclaiming against two government mortgage giants. They were unconstitutional from the beginning. They have cost taxpayers billions. They should be jettisoned. So let's just roll this back a little bit. Let's try to control our cynicism and give it a chance. Unless it comes to the Secretary of State. And I have to say that when we look at Kellyanne Conway coming out and saying Trump's four likely picks for Secretary of State... We've got the good, which would be Bob Corker. We've got, I would say, the bad, Giuliani. And then we've got the really, really ugly, Romney, and the ugliest of them all, General Petraeus, being discussed. Now, she does say, look, we don't know yet. Uh, this is going to be his decision. This list is fluid. It could expand. It could narrow. But when we look at these people, for instance, I say Corker, and I'm, you know, nobody is perfect in their background, but he does have a really good background. This is a guy who's a successful entrepreneur. He started out in 1978. He had been working uh, minimum wage jobs and saved up $8,000, started a construction company. Within 30 years, he built that to uh, a business and real estate that he sold for $19 million. So he goes from $8,000 to $19 million in 30 years. And then he kind of retires from that and he gets involved in government. He had a very successful tenure in government as a mayor in Chattanooga uh, with education and other things. So he's got a lot of good things in his background. Giuliani is a close friend of, of uh, Trump. He would be following his lead, I believe, and not working against him as Romney would. That's a, a big positive there. But when we look at General Petraeus, think about this. General Petraeus is someone who, back in 2014, was selling the TPP, something that Donald Trump says he's going to get rid of from day one. Petraeus was selling the TPP in 2014 as a matter of national security. And then he goes on to say that climate change is a matter of national security. <laughs> okay, it, before John Kerry was telling everybody that climate change was as big a threat to our national security as ISIS was, General Petraeus was doing that. So think about that. Just think about that for a moment. TPP is a national security issue. Climate change is a national security issue, according to David Petraeus. But real national security in terms of keeping track of classified documents, that's not an issue. That's a personal decision that he made. That was something for which he did get punished, but it was a misdemeanor, not a felony. And of course, when we look at this, the Daily Mail points out that if Trump were to pick Petraeus as his secretary of state, Petraeus would have to check in with his patrol officer. <laughs> do, do you see the, the problem with how this looks? I hope Donald Trump sees the problem with how this looks. They say the defendant shall submit his person, his residence, his office, vehicles, any computer systems, including computer data storage, media, or any electronic device capable of storing, retrieving, or accessing data to which they have access or control to a search from time to time conducted by U.S. probation officers and other such law enforcement personnel as the probation officer may deem advisable without warrant. Okay, so here's a guy that you're going to put in as Secretary of State, and I think he's like third, maybe fourth in line to the president. Uh, this is a guy who has ignored national security, and instead of going to jail with multiple felony convictions, he was kind of given a pass like Hillary Clinton. He did get a misdemeanor conviction.
And that's what we're looking at here. He got two years probation as a misdemeanor, and he got a fine of $100,000 for sharing massive amounts of information with his mistress, Paula Broadwell. So this is a guy, though, that under the terms of his parole, would have to notify the probation officer within 72 hours of any change in residence or change of employment. So he's going to have to call up the probation officer and say, uh, uh, hey, uh, uh, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, uh, I just got a new job. Oh, yeah, what is that job? Uh, Secretary of State. That's, that's absolutely insane, okay? And the fact that his documents would be subject without warrant to searches. How are we going to maintain security with that? And, of course, remember... That at Bilderberg, and he is a regular attendee of Bilderberg, he is part of the globalist inner circle. This is a guy who as, is as connected and as much of a made man by the globalist cabal as Henry Kissinger or Zbigniew Brzezinski. So this guy truly is the worst of the worst. And understand that his security issues are not over here and Hillary's are over here. They're intertwined with each other. There were 1,000, this is going back just to this last October from Fox News, 1,000 emails between Clinton and Petraeus that are missing from the records that were sent to the State Department, say the FBI. So out of the 30,000 emails, 1,000 of them were to him, and they're missing. It says CENTCOM records show approximately 1,000 work-related emails between Clinton's personal email and General David Petraeus, former commander of CENTCOM, and guess what? He sent those as CENTCOM commander. On January 10th, 2009, right at the beginning of the Clinton administration of the Secretary of State, she wrote General Petraeus, on an email, and said, as he was head of CENTCOM, uh, here's my personal address on my BlackBerry account. Quote, if there's anything you need or want me to know, please use a personal email address. All the best, Hillary. So this is a co-conspirator with, uh, with Hillary Clinton in these crimes. Not going to prosecute Hillary? Hillary for prison? Uh, you know, the optics on this, the double standard on this, incredibly bad. That would be a losing pop, uh, proposition. Well, that's it for tonight's news. Uh, join us on Monday, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern, for the InfoWars Nightly News.